Hello, my name is Bill Topping uh, and I'm a member of Putney Methodist Church. I work as part of the chaplaincy team at the University of Roehampton and that's also where I live and I'm in my office now. It's a real pleasure to be with you in this format again and I hope you're all keeping as well as possible uh, in these continually trying times. Before we begin, let's take uh, a moment to offer this time up to God together. Let's pray. Loving God, we join together once more today to engage with scripture and to be inspired by those in the stories we read. At a time of profound uncertainty, suffering, loneliness and loss, we gravitate back to your word and your example. Be present with us during this Bible study and open our hearts to the challenges posed to us from what we will read and hear. Keep front and centre for us the central messages of love for all, liberation for the oppressed, and humility from those with power to wield or renounce. We offer you this time and our very selves, this day and always. Amen. So today's Bible study focuses uh, on the story of Jesus' encounter with the Syrophoenician woman. I'll be looking at the version from Mark, although there is an equivalent in Matthew chapter 15 verses 21 to 28, in which she is referred to as a Canaanite, but we'll be focusing this morning on the passage from Mark. For this Bible study, I've been helped by a variety of uh, sources, in particular, a chapter in Eliz Elizabeth Schussler, Schussler's Fiorenza's book, but she said feminist practices of biblical interpretation, which I was able to access online. And then inspired by Friends's book, um, Interrupting Silence by Walter Brueggemann. And I also commend to you some essays from Barbara Kay Lundbland and Sung Yu Yang from the Preaching God's Transformation, uh, Transforming Justice series of uh, lectionary commentaries. I commend those to you. These sources have been wonderfully enlightening and powerful uh, and what I'll share with you today I hope will be interesting and particularly some aspects challenging. So let's first read together from Mark chapter 7 verses 24 to 30. From there he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him. And she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. This passage, I believe, has lots to tell us about how to act in the historic moment in which we find ourselves in currently. A quote from Brueggemann's chapter on this passage really jumped out at me when I read it again recently, and I believe it crucial for all of us during our time of profound racial trauma. This is, I believe, the case, whether it be the experience of Jesus or the Syrophoenician woman with which we more readily identify in this passage. Brueggemann says, Jesus turned out to be an apt student and the outsider woman was an effective teacher and witness. He was a quick learner and put his new learning to immediate and effective use. We will return to this quote, but for now, let's jump back to the beginning of our story. 
We meet Jesus in a house he has entered with the intention, we assume, of getting some time to himself, away from the crowds. It states in verse 24, he did not want anyone to know he was there. Perhaps he is tired and wanted to be fully able to enjoy the hospitality of his host, who has presumably invited him in. All of a sudden, a woman, whom we immediately learn is of Syrophoenician origin, intrudes on the scene and begs Jesus to cast a demon out of her daughter. It's worth noting here that this woman did not belong here. As a Gentile, a Syrophoenician, she would have been a cultural and ethnic outsider in a Jewish environment, that is to say, the physical room she was in and the people she was with, namely Jewish men, although the region of Tyre was in Syrophoenicia, so she was not an outsider geographically. Secondly, she's a woman crowding into a manly space in what is a heavily patriarchal society. Determined not to let proper protocol restrict her, she crosses the boundaries in her desperation to save her daughter and comes to Jesus, who is perhaps her last resort. We now see a side of Jesus we rarely see, a side that is disturbing to many of us. It would be easy to make excuses for Jesus. Maybe he was exhausted, hungry. But what he says is difficult to interpret in any other way than highly offensive. He says, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. The imagery here would have been understood by everyone who heard it. Jesus is implying that the children who should come first are the Jews and alarmingly, the dogs are the others, the outsiders, which would include this woman. Of course, the language here makes reference to food, perhaps due to the chapters that bookend this one, which we'll later address. But we can take the food to mean the transformative capacity of God's good power that has, in the words of Brugman, been peculiarly entrusted to the life and body of Jesus. I agree with Lundbland here, who states, and I quote, Our temptation is to prettify Jesus by saying he was testing the woman's faith, but there is no indication of that motivation in the text, end quote. Rather, we seem to be seeing Jesus limited by his place and time, so much so that his perceived scope of his ministry does not extend beyond the limited provincial categories of Jewish Galilee. Until now, there had been no challenge to that scope. And as there was plenty to do among Jewish peasants in Galilee, it seems his assumption was that that was the extent of his mission. This is a challenging interpretation, but I'd like to suggest, as some of the others that I've cited do too, that the Syrophoenician woman who now steps forward to speak re-educates Jesus, teaching him, challenging him to widen the scope of his power of transformative emancipation, an interaction that changes Jesus and motivates him to enact his ministry, of which we are all now beneficiaries, in new and further directions. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. What does she say? Verse 28, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. As Firenze points out, she contradicts Jesus. She exposes his insider mentality. She chooses the tactic that involves going along with the imagery Jesus has chosen, even accepting his premise that non-Jews are dogs, but asserts, in Brueggemann's words, that, quote, God's transformative capacity for goodness should not and cannot be monopolised by the Jews because it will spill over beyond that. At this point, perhaps we should pause to consider how much of our own lives are lived guided by an unconscious insider mentality. How many assumptions do we make about life and each other's lives based on this mentality? one that restricts us from being able to see the full picture and how others suffer while we sit comfortably, not bad people, 
simply people in need of re-educating. Perhaps we can be reassured at the implication that even Jesus on this occasion fell foul to this tendency. But it's not reassurance that we must derive from this. Rather, it is the lesson of what Jesus did then that must be our takeaway. And this is where what is happening in our world currently becomes so neatly adjoined with this passage. The terrors of entrenched, systematic and subconscious racism, in addition to the abhorrent, explicit forms, are a result of millions of us, those not the victims of such horror, residing lazily in our own unexamined comfort zones. Millions of Syrophoenician women are laying it all out there right now, crying, begging, demanding, many of them dying. They're demanding the opening of our hearts and the demolition of the status quo. To quote Brueggemann again, quote, contesting speech characteristically exposes the ideological force of the silence and privilege and invites us to a fresh take on the reality of God's world, end quote. Our brothers and sisters in this world are following the example of the Syrian Phoenician woman and are crying out, contradicting our assumptions, calling us to act and to change. For those to whom this call to action is directed, we have the same source as always to take our inspiration from. Jesus heard the challenge put to him and took it on board, acted accordingly. Consequently, the good news became a reality for all. In so doing, the Syrophoenician woman can, in the words of Firenze, quote, become visible again as one of the apostolic foremothers of Gentile Christians, end quote. Something that has been deliberately kept obfuscated, illustrated by the fact she is one of only two women in the Gospel of Mark with speaking parts. This story brings to the fore a number of our prejudices and institutional injustices and calls us to address them all. The transition within Jesus is illustrated by the two feeding stories that bookend chapter seven. Immediately before, we hear how Jesus feeds 5,000 people on the Jewish side of Galilee. In chapter eight, after his encounter with the Syrophoenician woman, Jesus feeds 4,000 in Gentile territory. At the first feeding, there's 12 baskets of bread left over, enough symbolically for one each of the 12 tribes of Israel. At the second, there are seven loaves and seven baskets left over, alluding to the seven nations that Israel had displaced in the old Israelite tradition. As Brueggemann points out, these nations had been forcibly displaced, but now Jesus sets them alongside his own people in Galilee as those who are able to share with Jews the food of the new regime of God. Jesus listens and agrees with the woman that he is wrong. Now it is no longer bread for the chosen people, but bread for the world. The transformative word of the Syrophoenician woman transforms Jesus. By bringing in the truth of her own experience and social location. As Joan Mitchell, who's quoted by Lumbland, says, she models an active, transformative receiving of the gospel that emancipates its word from socially and culturally constructed biases and boundaries. These are such boundaries that even restricted Jesus until he took the time to listen and learn. Such boundaries that restrict millions of us so that the remaining billions continue to suffer. Millions have followed the example of the Syrophoenician woman and cried out. It is up to us to whom these cries are directed to, as always, follow the example of Jesus and listen to the cry, not defensively, not passively, but to actively listen like Jesus did. So that like that which so invalided the Syrophoenician woman's daughter, the demons may be gone. 
To end with that quote again, Jesus turned out to be an apt student and the outsider woman was an effective teacher and witness. He was a quick learner and put his new learning to immediate and effective use. Our teachers are teaching. Are the rest of us learning? And if so, what will we do now that we are enlightened? Thanks for engaging with the Bible study today. I hope there was something in that that you found beneficial or can take away with you. God bless everyone. Stay well till I see you again.